It's springtime in North Carolina, but the thought always turns to basketball right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. I'm Mike Waddell. He's David Glenn. And DG, the season's just completed, but what is the starting point when you start to look ahead to the 24-25 college basketball season? Well, Mike, it's great to be with you again, as always. And you're right. We talk college basketball here in North Carolina 12 months out of the year. Uh, but to give the 60,000 feet view right out of the gate, the first thing to remember is that it is going to be an 18-team league in the Atlantic Coast Conference for the first time in this league's 71-year history. It is crazy to think of things this way, but way back in 1953, the ACC started as a league with only seven members. Although two of those original seven, South Carolina and Maryland, haven't been members of this conference since 1971 and 2014, respectively. Virginia actually joined the ACC very shortly after the original seven. A little history lesson for the newest members of the ACC and their fan bases. So many do refer to the Cavaliers as an original ACC member as well. That's okay with me. But technically, the Cavs really jumped aboard the ACC in its second season, way back in the 1950s. Anyway, we have seen a lot of expansion and realignment over the years. Georgia Tech joined in 1979. Florida State joined in 1991. Miami and Virginia Tech in 2004. Boston College in 05. Notre Dame and Pitt and Syracuse in 2013. And then Louisville in 2014. Here we are a decade later, and here we go again. This time, the ACC will officially stretch all the way to Dallas, Texas, and basically to the Pacific Ocean, which does sound crazy, but is actually happening. Cal, Stanford, and SMU will officially become ACC members this July and this August. To be specific, the Mustangs arrive technically on July 1st, Cal and Stanford technically on August 2nd. Regardless of those details, for the first time ever, if you want to talk ACC basketball, you have 18 different teams to discuss. We will not get into all 18 today, mercifully, in part because some of these rosters still have such extreme unpredictability as we speak. But we can offer a big picture type snapshot for the league as we continue to watch things like the transfer portal, incoming and outgoing, plus early NBA draft decisions and a few other things here as we head into the offseason. David, the NBA draft is another big basketball event coming up here in the springtime. And as we sit here in mid-April, there are a lot of important deadlines and decisions to be made involving a lot of different standouts in the Atlantic Coast Conference. What's your take on what might unfold here as the NBA looks to shore up their next set of rookies? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike, and I think I can outline most of that for you fairly quickly. First, one deadline for fans to remember is April 27th. That is the NBA's early entry deadline. Now, some ACC guys, as we speak, have announced their decisions already. A bunch of others haven't said a word yet, at least not publicly. But for example, Miami senior center, Norchad O'Meara, he's an all-ACC player who could have played a fifth year of college hoops next season under those COVID rules, has announced that he is moving on to the pros. Miami has a freshman guard named Keyshawn George, who has been told he might be a first-round NBA pick. He has said he's moving on from the Hurricanes, too. During the regular season, Virginia's senior point guard, Reese Beekman, did say that this was going to be his last go-around in college basketball, and he's moving on from the Cavaliers. Obviously, that's a very big deal in Charlottesville as they try to pick up the pieces from a very strange season and have to do that without their best player, Reese Beekman. Pitt's freshman point guard, Bub Carrington, who made the ACC's all-freshman team, and understandably so. He has at least a chance to be a first-round NBA selection. He has confirmed early NBA entry as well. And since we're including the three new schools in today's discussion, quick mention that California's best player, he's a junior wing named Jalen Tyson. He also has entered the draft early as a possible first-round pick. So that obviously impacts the Bears' initial ACC season in a negative way. As we speak today, though, we haven't heard officially from Duke's sophomore forward Kyle Filipowski. 
We haven't heard officially from Duke's freshman guard, Jared McCain. Those guys are projected as first-round NBA locks, maybe even lottery picks, so they're expected to leave the Blue Devils. But again, they haven't announced anything yet, at least as we're having this conversation today. There are other guys who would be drafted probably if they came out this year. It's not considered a very strong draft, and some of these guys have their eyes on that as an opening, but they haven't announced anything yet in these cases either. On that list, I would put Syracuse's sophomore point guard, Judah Mintz, who was a second-team All-ACC selection this year. Wake Forest junior guard, Hunter Salas, who had a first-team All-ACC breakout year with the Demon Deacons after, remember, being a backup at Gonzaga the previous two years. Miami's junior guard, Wooga Poplar. He's a guy a lot of NBA scouts really like. No word from him yet. North Carolina's junior forward, Harrison Ingram, third-team All-ACC this year with the Heels after transferring in from Stanford. No word yet there. Even Virginia's sophomore forward, Ryan Dunn, who's a very limited offensive player at this stage of his career, but also, of course, one of the best defensive players in the entire country. Despite Ryan Dunn's very modest offensive numbers, he is absolutely on the NBA's radar as well. No word from him yet on his plans. There is also some level of NBA interest, not only the guys I just mentioned, but others who could be first rounders, could be second rounders, or could be undrafted free agents. It's important to remember, only first round draft picks automatically get guaranteed millions of dollars. Second round picks can try to negotiate for guaranteed money, but the dollars are obviously lower. And again, the money is not automatically guaranteed to second round picks or certainly undrafted free agents. Remember, the only two ACC guys one year ago who were promised first round status both left. Duke's freshman center, Derek Lively. Duke's freshman forward, Derek Whitehead. They were actually both role players for the Blue Devils, but they both jumped to the NBA and they were both rewarded with first round money. So those turned out to be good decisions in that regard. Remember last year, ACC's player of the year, Isaiah Wong of Miami, the guard, he was picked in the second round last year, but he decided to go even though he had eligibility remaining. And NC State's guard, Terquavion Smith, wasn't selected in the draft at all, but he left the Wolfpack early. He did sign with the Sixers as a free agent. So some guys know they're leaving regardless of their projected draft status. Other guys tend to wait for feedback from NBA people, and some will only go if they're going to be picked. Some will only go if they'll be that first round pick with the guaranteed money. It varies a lot from guy to guy, family to family. But before we move on from the NBA draft, I need to mention one more deadline and one more group of players. So that early NBA entry deadline, April 27th, not too far away as we speak. Just remember, we may not have all of these answers until closer to May 29th. That's a month and a half from now. That's the NCAA's deadline for withdrawing from the NBA draft without penalty. So that second deadline, again, a month and a half away as we speak. So there will be loose ends for quite a while in these conversations. But the final group of players I want to mention with professional basketball in mind, whether it's the NBA or somewhere else, is the group that just finished their fourth season of college basketball, but who used one of those four seasons of eligibility during that 2020-21 campaign or the so-called COVID season. Remember, NCAA rules allow all of those guys another year of eligibility if they want it even if they just finished what we would traditionally call their fourth or senior season. Think of the names on this list and the impacts they could have as we discuss next season in the ACC if they chose to play a fifth season the way last year Armando Baycott did at Carolina, Cormac Ryan did at Carolina, Joe Girard did at Clemson, Quentin Post did at Boston College, Hunter Couture did at Virginia Tech, and the NC State trio of DJ Burns, a sixth-year guy, DJ Horn, a fifth-year guy, Casey Marcel, a fifth-year guy. All of those guys were playing their so-called super senior COVID campaign. Some of the guys I just mentioned were all ACC this past year. There were other outstanding guys on that list as well. And in that Wolfpack trio case, they led the, the, the Wolfpack to the ACC title and the Final Four. This year, those with the option of what we call that super senior campaign 
in 2024-25 looking ahead include UNC guard R.J. Davis, the 2024 ACC Player of the Year, Clemson's forward P.J. Hall, another first-team All-ACC guy with R.J. Davis, Duke guard Jeremy Roach, he was third-team All-ACC this year, Wake Forest forward Andrew Carr, maybe a cut below All-ACC, but a really good player for the Deacons. Clemson's point guard, Chase Hunter, a huge factor in the Tigers' run to the Elite Eight, is on this list. Pitt guard Ishmael Leggett, the ACC Sixth Man of the Year, has that bonus year available if he wants it. And three more additional appoint, uh, important guys at NC State, starting point guard Michael O'Connell, starting power forward Mo Diara, and veteran guard Cam Woods. The latter didn't play much for the Wolfpack this year, but he was an all-CAA player at North Carolina A&T last season and could play a lot next year with Horn and Morcel moving on to the next level. Miami's point guard, Nigel Pack, has already said he will use his extra COVID year of eligibility and stay with the Canes. Some of the Canes incoming transfers will be fifth-year COVID guys as well. But most of these other possible super seniors have not yet announced publicly their intentions yet. And obviously, those decisions will impact the ACC's upcoming 2024-25 season in very significant ways. One last thing before your next question, since we're talking about deadlines. The last day a men's basketball player can enter his name into the transfer portal under the new revised NCAA rules is May 1st. If you want to transfer and you miss that deadline, you may not be immediately eligible next season at your new school. So they got to hit the May 1st deadline. So basically, we'll know all the guys who intend to transfer out by May 1st, and we'll know most of the guys' decisions inbound by May 1st. But that does not mean we'll have everybody's choice of a new school by May 1st. Some loose ends will linger well into the latter part of the spring, and occasionally even into the summer months. We've that, had that in years past, but I think we have more of that these days than we've ever had previously. One of my favorite restaurants in Raleigh for many years now has been The Oak, Scratch Kitchen and Bourbon Bar. It's located on Lake Boone Trail, which is a perfect location for a great meal and beverage if you're on your way to nearby Carter-Finley Stadium or perhaps PNC Arena for a concert, Wolfpack or Hurricanes game, or other event. The menu is incredibly tasty and creative. The atmosphere is a lot of fun. The bourbon options are as high-end and varied as you'll find anywhere. The staff is super classy and first-rate, and I've just always loved the people, the food, and the overall vibe there. When I took Carolina Hurricanes owner Tom Dundon to lunch, yes, meaning the billionaire who owns the hockey team, I took him to the Oak. Seriously, it's that good. Learn more or make a reservation by visiting their website, theoakraleigh.com. That's theoakraleigh.com. One thing that we've never had previously is people on social media hypothesizing on whether or not a player will come back because his girlfriend has now put herself into the transfer portal as well. So those are some of the crazy things of 2024. Another very unique thing is that sports wagering is now legal in North Carolina. And as you know, there are a lot of Vegas lines right now going on about who stays, who goes, and who is going to be up in the upper echelons of college basketball a year from now. That includes the ACC schools, all 18 of them. That includes UConn. That includes Kentucky, who is looking for a head coach after John Calipari has now made his way to Fayetteville and the University of Arkansas. So it's a real crazy world right there when you look at college basketball and especially the entanglement with the fan base and wagering. Yeah, Mike, and I just saw a list from one of the wise guys in Vegas that had those schools you mentioned, back-to-back -back national champion UConn, the always interesting Kentucky Wildcats, those Duke Blue Devils, and North Carolina Tar Heels from our backyard. They were the four with the best odds of winning next year's national championship. So we will save our complete longer form uh, team by team offseason breakdowns here at the North Carolina Sports Network for some coming days and videos. But I'll try to give you the short answer here on the Blue Devils first. 
the starting point for the optimism behind Duke at this extremely early stage being listed as one of the favorites for next year's national championship, even though there are so many moving parts right now around Duke basketball and really around college basketball. The starting point at Duke is a guy that we already know will be wearing a Blue Devils uniform next season. We're not waiting for an answer. It's incoming freshman Cooper Flagg. He is the number one high school senior in America, now playing for the powerful Montverde Academy program in Florida. And the NBA scouts already like Cooper Flagg so much that he is projected as the number one overall pick in the 2025 NBA draft, meaning after a one-and-done season with the Blue Devils in Durham. He is that good. He's about six foot nine, 200 pounds. He plays forward, and he does it all. He can score. He can rebound. He is an elite defender for a young guy. He's an excellent passer. He's a leader. He's a competitor. Cooper Flagg, who grew up in Maine, actually turned down a scholarship offer from UConn, which is only about a four-hour drive from his original high school up in Maine before he jumped to that private school program, a prestigious one in Florida. Even the legendary Duke coach Mike Krzyzewski has said that under the old rules, when guys could go straight from high school to the NBA, Cooper Flagg would have been good enough to do exactly that. That's Coach K saying that. Flagg is expected to be not only first team All-ACC right away, but an All-American too, even as a freshman, even in an era where we do not see that as often, thanks to immediately eligible transfers, thanks to college basketball being older than it has been in a long time, if not ever. Even as a freshman, Cooper Flagg is expected to compete for those sorts of accolades. Now, obviously, Flagg or anybody else needs help, right? Hypothetically, hypothetically, because we don't know yet, let's just say that Kyle Filipowski and Jared McCain, because they're projected as first-round picks, they do leave for the NBA. But let's also pretend, again, we don't know yet, but hypothetically, let's pretend that Jeremy Roach stays in Durham for a super senior season and that the other key guys stay as well. Even with power forward Mark Mitchell recently putting his name in the transfer portal, Duke's starting lineup could include junior point guard Tyrese Proctor. He'd be a three-year starter by next season. Fifth-year senior guard Jeremy Roach, he'd be a five-year starter who's already been all ACC if he stays for that bonus year. Sophomore guard Caleb Foster, who just had a very good rookie year before getting hurt late in the season. And then a guy like Cooper Flagg, one of the most hyped players Duke has ever signed, and that is saying something. One of the things that you just talked about was young talent and how it sometimes takes young talent time to blossom. At North Carolina, the Tar Heels were a true beneficiary in 2023-24 by the incoming roster additions of Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram. Now, we know Ryan is gone. Ingram could be on the way out. The two silent leaders, the veteran Tar Heels, were Armando Bacot, who we know is finally leaving college. In R.J. Davis's case, even if he's not drafted, if he gets into the great situation with an NBA GM and a coach where he can develop, he can truly pick his spot, a lot like D.J. Burns. But if the Tar Heels were to lose those big four players of Ryan, Ingram, and Davis, and Bacot, how could Las Vegas have the Tar Heels in the nation's top 10, let alone the nation's top 25? It would seem like that would be a truly rebuilding effort for head coach Hubert Davis going into his fourth year. Well, Mike, your question raises a good point, and I will answer the Tar Heels look-ahead question too. But I could have and should have said this when I was talking about Duke as well. But one thing always to keep in mind is that gambling lines are always set with the intent to maximize the amount of money bet. So those four schools we mentioned earlier, Duke, Carolina, Kentucky, UConn, they're all huge brand names, right? It's not mere coincidence that they're listed out in Vegas by the wise guys as the four with the best odds of winning next year's national title. Along with UCLA, remember, those are the four schools with the most national championships, all time, and that tends to energize betters. So do big brand names. So people who gamble for fun always need to remember that. For example, when Vegas makes Team A a three-point favorite over Team B during the regular season or the NCAA tournament, it does not mean that the wise guys think Team A is 
exactly three points better than team B. What it does mean is that they believe that putting the line at three points will inspire betting on both sides, the favorite minus three and the underdog plus three. They don't really care what the where that line is drawn. They care about their bottom line financially, and it's all about motivating bets. So keep that in mind, whether it's on these national championship line forecasts or any other time you're putting at stake, hopefully something much less than the kids' college tuition fund, as I like to say. Anyway, having the Tar Heels this high in those rankings, if you will, must be based, as you implied with your question, Mike, on Carolina's best case scenario. In UNC's best case scenario, they will be a national contender again, just as they were this year when they spent most of the season in the national top 10, won the regular season in the ACC, and earned a precious number one seed in the NCAA tournament. They lost in the Sweet 16, but they certainly fit the definition of a national contender this past season. Best case scenarios rarely end up coming true, as UNC recently learned with valuable sixth man Seth Trimble putting his name in the transfer portal. But in UNC's revised best case scenario, and that's still all it is right now involving a lot of guesswork, the best UNC team would have R.J. Davis as a sharpshooter, Ian Jackson as a wing creator, Elliot Cadeau is an improving but still pass first point guard. Harrison Ingram as that Swiss Army knife forward, an incoming transfer who can shoot the lights out, and another incoming transfer, or maybe a returning player, or even incoming freshman big man James Brown, who can help right away in the post. There will be a lot of talent in Chapel Hill next season. We're not sure of exactly how much talent yet, but those are the reasons for the optimism. Here's the best case scenario for UNC looking forward to next year. Let's say point guard Elliot Cadeau stays for his sophomore season. He continues his outstanding ball handling, outstanding passing, pretty good penetrating skills offensively, pretty solid defense, and maybe Cadeau becomes a lot better shooter from the perimeter and the free throw line and the three-point line. Another hypothetical, R.J. Davis, that 2024 ACC Player of the Year, decides to stay for his fifth and final season, taking advantage of that NCAA rule regarding the COVID season of 2021. More hypotheticals, Hubert Davis goes out and finds a big-time shooter in the transfer portal with no more Cormac Ryan. We know, actually, that Hubert is chasing several shooters right now, including a guy who knew, who grew up in North Carolina. So maybe that works to the Tar Heels' advantage on the recruiting trail, as it often does. Hypothetically, Harrison Ingram stays for his senior season rather than jumping to the NBA. And maybe he goes from being a third-team All-ACC player to a first-team All-ACC player, hypothetically, next season. Meanwhile, hypothetically, Hubert Davis finds another quality post player in the portal to go with returnee Jalen Washington, who's a rising junior and a really good offensive player with an amazing touch for a big man, but maybe not somebody who's ready for starter type Armando Baycott kind of minutes at both ends of the floor. Oh, by the way, UNC does have at least one of the other very best freshmen entering the ACC next season. Ian Jackson is a six foot five guard from New York City, and he is one of the top 10 high school seniors in America, according to the consensus. If you watch the McDonald's All-American game, you know why he is viewed that way. An incredible amount of skill. He's not an elite shooter at this stage of his development, but he's incredibly creative with the ball. He's dangerous off the dribble. He can lead to his own buckets with that creativity or create open shots for his teammates when defensive help collides or collapses on him. Jackson is really, really good. It would be an absolute shock if two of the five slots on next year's All-ACC All-Freshman team aren't taken by Duke's Cooper Flag and UNC's Ian Jackson, two guys who are expected to be not only big-time college players, but also big-time NBA prospects after that. Another UNC high school signee on his way in is a six-foot-six wing player named Drake Powell. He is from Northwood High School in Pittsburgh, right there near Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and he could have an immediate impact for the Tar Heels next season as well. There is only one basketball after all, and the best UNC team would have R.J. Davis as a sharpshooter, Ian Jackson as a creator, Cadeau as an improving but still pass-first point guard, an incoming transfer who can shoot the lights out, junior rather, and Jalen Washington who has that so uh, soft touch for a big man. 
Meanwhile, Jalen Withers could return for his super senior campaign at forward as another athletic defender who could help the Carolina rotation if he stays for that extra year. There will be, the bottom line, there will be a lot of talent in Chapel Hill next season. We're not exactly sure of how much talent yet, and we're not exactly sure how many of those star players will remain in Chapel Hill, but that outline includes the reasons for that optimism in Las Vegas. Beyond the Tar Heels and the Blue Devils, what other ACC teams do you feel like could truly be national championship contenders next season? Yeah, this is a leap of faith since we're only in mid-April, but if you if I had to pick one team right now, it'd be the Miami Hurricanes. And I know that may sound strange because the Canes just finished 14th in a 15-team ACC. I get the skepticism, but everyone needs to get used to these modern-day roller coasters in major college basketball. Here's a quick reminder. In 2022, that was just two seasons ago, Miami had what was then the best program in the history, the best season in the history of the program, 26 wins and a trip to the Elite Eight. In 2023, just one season ago, those same Hurricanes of Jim Laranaga topped that previous year with their new best season in program history, 29 wins and ACC regular season championship, meaning a tie for first place in this regular season ACC standings, plus Remember, a postseason run all the way to the Final Four, the program's first ever appearance in the national semifinals. I will not even try today to explain what just happened this past season when UM fell from those two brilliant seasons all the way to 14th, 14th place in a 15-team league, but I will try to briefly explain why the Canes have a chance to bounce back and bounce back so far next season in a very big way. Whereas... A lot of ACC teams do not have answers from their key players. Miami actually has a bunch of answers already. The starting center, Norchad O'Meara, all-ACC guy, he is leaving for the professional ranks. Now, that's not good in a sense. Of course, you're losing a great player, but certainty helps on the recruiting trail. When a recruit sees that O'Meara's not going to play 30-plus minutes a game at a very important position, they're more intrigued. In the hurric by the Hurricanes if a scholarship offer comes their way. Meanwhile, point guard Nigel Pack has already given his answer. He can be an all-ACC player when he's playing at his best. He is going to return for his fifth-year senior campaign. That's more certainty. That's good. It allows Jim Laranega and his staff to attract others and say, we have so-and-so and so-and-so back. We need you to put us over the top. It's a lot harder if you have a skeleton roster with no great players to point to because everybody wants to play for a winner. Besides Nigel Pack's return, rising senior forward Matthew Cleveland, a Swiss Army Knife-type talent formerly of Florida State, he hasn't said anything yet, but he could return. Rising senior guard Wooga Poplar, an NBA prospect, hasn't announced yet, but could return. All three of those guys, Pack, Poplar, and Cleveland, are going to play professional basketball someday. I'm not saying they'll all end up in the NBA, but they will all make a lot of money as professionals, either in the NBA or somewhere else in the world. That's a nice nucleus, or whatever part of that nucleus stays for Jim Laranega. Again, Pack, we know is staying. We'll see about the others. Meanwhile, as usual, the Canes have been extremely active in the transfer portal, and they've already landed two guys who could start for them right away next season. Power forward Brandon Johnson is a guy we've seen here in our backyard at East Carolina for the last three seasons. Center Lynn Kidd is a guy we've seen in ACC country because he's previously of the Clemson Tigers and previously of the Virginia Tech Hokies. Brandon Johnson, they're both already headed to Miami out of the transfer portal. Brandon Johnson averaged 14 points and nine rebounds per game and shot 37% from three-point last season for the Pirates. And remember, that came in a top-10 league, the American Athletic Conference. You have to be a little more wary when someone puts up big numbers in a bottom-tier conference. Not so when you're getting a guy from a Power 6 league or another member of the top 10 like the AAC. At Virginia Tech last season, meanwhile, Kid averaged 13 points and seven rebounds a game while only playing 23 minutes a game. And he shot 67% from the field, 84% on free throws. Jim Laranaga loves those high efficiency guys at every position. And he just got two more of them. 
Those are great numbers by Johnson, great numbers by Kidd. And I think Miami is on the verge of adding another scoring guard to the mix from the transfer portal any day now. I mean, it could happen while we're speaking. The Canes are that active with multiple guys on the inbound. One more thing about the Canes. They have one of the most highly regarded men's basketball recruits in the history of their school coming in. He is from my original hometown, the Philadelphia area. His name is Jaleel Bethea, and he was one of the top 10 seniors in America this year, as I mentioned, with Duke's Cooper flag and Carolina's Ian Jackson. We don't see that as often over the decades, yes, in football at Miami, not as often in men's basketball. This guy, Bethea, played in the McDonald's All-American game earlier this month. He's really, really good. I'll Probably again, minute, top, I'll come down Probably again, top three among ACC signees behind Duke's Cooper flag and alongside UNC's Ian Jackson. These dudes can play, and I'm looking forward to seeing all of them and more in ACC uniforms next season. This Miami roster obviously does need more time to shake out. Some of the guys I just mentioned – may indeed leave, but I guarantee you more talent is coming in to, through the transfer portal to Carl Gables. And overall, if you ask me for one team to watch that is not on the national radar as much, I'd say that that hurricane watch is in order for the next this coming season in the ACC. Since this is the North Carolina Sports Network, we can't let you go without talking about the ACC Tournament champion, North Carolina State Wolfpack, what they'll be like next year, and also Steve Forbes and the Wake Forest Demon Deacons, and if they can get back to the NCAA Tournament in 2024-25. Yeah, the first thing to remember about NC State, and I don't want to bring anybody down from the cloud that they're riding because of the Wolfpack's most successful season in decades. It is accurate, though, to say that three-fifths of that special starting lineup that took all of us on that magic carpet ride, three-fifths of that starting lineup is gone. So your sixth-year center, D.J. Burns, has run out of eligibility. Your fifth-year all-ACC guard, D.J. Horn, has run out of eligibility. Your defensive specialist, Casey Morcell, has run out of eligibility. That chemistry obviously is gone forever, and you have to rebuild new chemistry with new guys. There is portal help on the way. Louisville's best player this past season was its big guy, Brandon Huntley Hatfield. He's about 6'10", 240 pounds. He averaged about 13 points and eight rebounds a game while shooting 57% from the field this season for the Cardinals and playing more than 30 points minutes per game, which not a lot of big guys can do. So Brandon Huntley Hatfield will help Kevin Keats's team in the post. He's, I'm sure, looking for more help at other positions in the transfer portal as we speak. The bottom line, if you wanted me to circle one thing about a key for the Wolfpack, is they kind of have to break their log jam at the guard position. And remember, Michael O'Connell can come back for his super senior season if he wants to at point guard, just as Mo Diara has that option at power forward. But the pack has a roster with a whole bunch of wing players, and they're all intriguing, and they're all talented, and we've all seen them at times, college or high school, be very productive, but there's nobody that we know can be great by ACC standards. Is that going to be a guy like Cam Woods? I'm not even sure who's staying, right? But Cam Woods was an all-conference player at North Carolina A&T. He was the man for the Aggies prior to transferring to NC State. He didn't play much this year, in part because of some eligibility issues, but he's a talented guy that maybe can be that versatile scorer to go alongside your point guard. Could it be Dennis Parker Jr., who was a talented freshman for the Wolfpack this season, before missing time late in the season because of an illness. Could it be MJ Rice? Is he going to stay at NC State? That's a former McDonald's All-American who started his college career at Kansas, transferred to NC State, left the team for a while. Where is his head? Where is his heart? There is talent in there. Is he going to be with the Wolfpack? Can he be part of the solution? We shall see. There's two incoming freshmen who are also wing players. Trey Parker and Paul McNeil. Are one or both of them ready to be rotation players in the ACC, which remember, as last season showed, 
most freshmen are not ready to be great at the ACC level. There were three or four freshmen who were really good in the whole league, I mean. And then after that, role players. Elliot Cadeau made the all-freshman team for the ACC as the fifth man on the, on the five-man all-freshman team. He was a very deferential supporting cast member of the Tar Heels, but he was one of the five most impactful freshmen. That's just how it's going for freshmen in this era where college basketball, again, is older and more experienced than it's been in a long time and maybe ever. Breon Pass actually had some fascinating moments late for the Wolfpack this season. He's another wing player and an intriguing scorer when he's on, but that's a lot of wing players I just mentioned. Kevin Keats needs to sort out that log jam, get uh, Brandon Huntley Hatfield in a rotation with Ben Middlebrooks, assuming he stays, but replacing the magic is a tall task for any coach, and that includes the 2024 ACC champion Kevin Keats and his NC State Wolfpack. I am a better person and a more effective business owner for having known and learned from Emily Parks over many years now. Emily's company, Organize for Success, helps multi-passionate business owners and executives bring harmony to all the layers of their lives, from work to side projects, from friends and family to hobbies, community, and beyond. With Emily's help, you too can make every minute matter. She helps you determine what earns your time and how to efficiently accomplish what matters. One of the many things I love about Emily is that she does not impose her will on her clients. She listens to them. That way she can better help them cultivate the lives they want to live. You can set up a complimentary call with Emily today by visiting organizeforsuccess.com. I'll just give you the dream scenario for the Demon Deacons, because remember, while very entertaining to watch under Steve Forbes, they have not yet made the NCAA tournament and at some under Steve Forbes. And at some point, that becomes every coach's job. That is the ultimate litmus test in the sport of college basketball. You got to make the big dance. And this will be year five upcoming for Steve Forbes. In the dream scenario, not only do I think the Deeks could make the big dance, I think they could make a run at an ACC title. And before you think I'm crazy, just think of the dream scenario. Demon Deacons are chasing a transfer portal point guard right now. I know Boopy Miller transferred out. I think that could turn out well for the Deacons. Just like Caleb Love leaving North Carolina worked out well for Love at Arizona, but also worked out extremely well for the Tar Heels without him in Chapel Hill. I think similar things could happen for Boopy Miller elsewhere and Wake Forest without Boopy in Winston-Salem. We'll see what transfer portal point guard comes down the pike. Some people believe that Deeks won't even sign a transfer point guard. They'll just use their existing players as point guards. I'm not sure that would be a good idea. So I expect the Deeks to sign a transfer portal. They're looking at a guy from LaSalle right now who may fit the bill. We'll see. He's not the only one. But let's say Hunter Salas tests the NBA waters but decides to stay. Now, if he's told he's a first-round lock, probably jumps. If he's told it's not that clear, maybe he stays. Hunter Salas, as your starting wing guard after that breakout first-year, first-team All-ACC season, would be a dream scenario for the Deeks. Another senior guard, Cameron Hildreth, will be back. Fifth-year senior stretch forward Andrew Carr could use his COVID season. So he's played four years of college basketball, but he fits that category where he has one more optional year if he wants it. Maybe he returns. Efton Reed III can return at center for his senior season. If all that happened, you'd have an incredibly talented, incredibly experienced starting lineup at Wake Forest. And I'm serious about making a run at an ACC regular season title, an ACC tournament title, uh, a big time, not only return to the NCAA tournament, but doing some damage there. That's the dream scenario. Transfer point guard, Hunter Salas, Cam Hildreth, Andrew Carr, Efton Reed III. Maybe they don't all return, we'll see. But on top of that, as long as these guys stay, they have a sharp shooting young guard in Parker Friedrichson. They also have already signed a transfer portal addition from Appalachian State named Trayvon Spillers. Quickly on him, he was first team all Sun Belt for a Mountaineers team that was one of the best in the history of that program. Trayvon Spiller is an absolute dog of a rebounder. He will scrap with you on defense as well. And those are things that I believe this Demon Deacons team lacked at times 
and just falling short of an NCAA tournament bid. He's only six foot seven, but he has power forward skills. It'll be fascinating to see how Steve Forbes, who's kind of been the transfer portal whisperer during his time with the Demon Deacons, fascinating to see how he uses Trayvon Spillers in that front court for the Demon Deacons. Wake also has a talented incoming freshman named Juke Harris. He's a top 100 player in the senior class from Salisbury, North Carolina. And they they might get help from another returning player or another transfer portal addition. We'll see. But if the Deeks get most of what I just described, I think it can be the best season for Steve Forbes next year, meaning year five for him with the Demon Deacons. That's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell, and this has been our too early look ahead to the 2024-25 season in college basketball. It's brought to you, as always, by the North Carolina Port Council. We'll talk to you again soon, right here on the North Carolina Sports Network.